You'll remember that we looked at a basically linguistic paradigm, from a way of thinking about and analyzing translations, which used the term equivalence. And equivalence, as far as that paradigm was concerned, was fairly straightforward, a thing of equal value, and you would then play around with the ways of making that equation to get the equal value. The equivalence paradigm was complex but united in that they all thought the ideal was equivalence, and that meant equivalent to a source text. And so you would analyze a source text, as you probably do in, in most of your classes. Or, or when you're going over the, the, the renditions you give interpreting, a reference will be made back to that original speech uh, to assess your quality. That's an issue I'm going to look at in today's talk. Skopos theory, the theories of purpose, came in and said, well, no, the key thing is not the source text. The source text is not the king, not the queen. Uh, what's important is the reason why you're interpreting or translating, the action you hope to achieve in a particular situation. And uh, that purpose, which they called Skopos, became the most essential thing in a translation performance. That was from about 1984. Now, within European translation studies, at least, the same years, that is the mid-1980s, but really from 1978, the late 70s, uh, marks the formation of an alternative way of thinking about translation. And here is a very schematic way of betraying this. From 1978, uh, Hans Vermeer, really the founder of that Skopos theory, said, as we saw last week, equivalence exists, it, it's a noble thing to try to achieve, but it's only in special cases when the translation and the source have the same function or are supposed to have the same function. But that's a special case. And in most cases, we've got two different functions, and therefore we have to do far more than uh, look for a, a narrow text-based kind of equivalence. And, and so that paradigm shift, epistemological break, if you will, uh, didn't negate the previous paradigm, it just made it smaller. And the field of translation became bigger, of what translators do. Remember we saw that map of translation studies, we saw that translators do more than translators. Very important insight, I think. From 1978, an Israeli scholar called Gideon Turi had exactly the opposite approach. His position was, look, and he was coming really from literary studies, from comparative literature um, in, in European and, and uh, Middle Eastern languages. He said, look, there are all these translations around us. And they're all different. And everybody's translating in different ways. Instead of coming in and telling everybody how they should translate, first I have to understand what they're doing, and hopefully why they're doing it. So his proposal was, look, if they call it a translation, if anybody calls that thing a translation, then it's equivalent. If I call something a translation, we suppose it's equivalent to something. That's part of the way we use the term. And now, I'm going to set out to discover what kinds of equivalence people actually achieve. Okay? Instead of telling you what the purpose should be and how you should achieve it, uh, this more analytical approach, more literary approach, would say, well, let's see what people actually do. And Gideon Turi put forward the, the term and the paradigm of descriptive translation studies. Instead of prescribing what you're supposed to do, that's what your teachers are paid to do, scholarship can set out to describe what actually happens in the world. And let's see where that takes us. So where equivalence became quite small for Femer, in exactly the same years, it became everywhere for Turing. These were two ways of solving the problem of defining equivalence, if you like. 
Gideon Turi was not alone. He was working in a long and quite noble tradition, which goes back to the Russian formalists. I'm not going to give you a detailed lesson on this, it's not the place for it, but just to sketch up what had happened. From the first years of the 20th century, in Moscow and, and uh, St. Petersburg, uh, people set out to describe artistic language and artistic works in scientific ways. That was really coming from 19th century positivism. Uh, that led on to uh, contacts with um, a school of uh, uh, linguistics in, uh, in Prague, then a school of wider linguistics or semiotics in Copenhagen, and some members of that, notably Roman Jakobson, the Russian linguist, came to the United States eventually. That interact, interact, intersected with a, an, an Israeli scholar, Itamar Evan Zohar, who met these people and made contacts with them in Copenhagen, learned Russian, Gideon Turing was his student, and from there began something called the Tel Aviv School, a group of scholars in the 1980s and 1990s, working along these lines in Tel Aviv in Israel. That's one line. Another line, this is throughout the 20th century again, it goes from the Russian formalists, but this time more directly to the Prague School of, of linguists and literary scholars, also developing in Bratislava, in Slovakia, and uh, these would be known as the Prague School, which continued through uh, to the 1960s, 1970s, and some people in Prague told me Tell me, it's very much alive today. A third strand uh, went through the publication of the Russian formalist work in the structuralist years in the 60s and 70s, picked up by an American living in Amsterdam, James S. Holmes, who around him formed a group of uh, people who were Flemings or, or Dutch, uh, Andre Lefebvre, uh, Josie Lambert, Theo Hermans. And that formed the Low Country School, uh, people doing this kind of research in uh, Holland and northern Belgium especially. I note this because all these people are working in fairly small countries in minority cultures. Israel uh, was now the Czech Republic and Slovakia and the Low Countries. Uh, there was interest in translation in the smaller cultures. From this group of people who all met each other and got to work with each other in Europe in really the 1980s, uh, a paradigm started to form of which these might be the main concepts. First, that we're going to study translation and we're going to call it translation studies as a discipline or interdiscipline working within linguistics, comparative literature, communication studies, cultural studies, whatever you want. That is, interdiscipline, working within the overlaps. And this discipline will be empirical. Instead of focusing on the source site, source culture, source text, author, as the equivalence paradigm had done, the general focus shifted to the target site. And, and Gideon Turi stated quite plainly, translations are facts of the target system, system or culture. Okay. Uh, they are done for Turi by the target system to fill in gaps. So instead of everything happening on the source side, a lot of things, and here I think it's an overstatement, most things happen on the target side. Note that this was also happening in Skopos theory in the same years, the shift from source to target to the client, usually on the target side. This paradigm pushed itself away from prescriptive approaches. It said, we must not tell people how to translate. We must not sit down and say, what a bad translation, look at all the mistakes. We're going to say, hmm, what an interesting set of translation shifts. I wonder how that came about. Okay. Uh, so it wasn't a teaching paradigm was really a literary scholar's understanding the world of time paradigm.
in tune with the, the change of, of literary studies itself and cultural studies, in, in tune with, with the general tendency to look not just at texts, but at wider social contexts, uh, descriptive translation studies moved very much to a view of not just looking at the translation, but at who the translator is or was. And then for André Lefebvre, who worked uh, in the latter part of his life in, at Austin, Texas, in the United States, uh, to looking at patronage, who the client was, how did the translator get money, who paid whom for what. Uh, perhaps the most important thing in the translation is not the scopus, as Hans Vermeer had said, but the money, as most professionals would agree. And um, from the work of uh, Itamar Evans Ola, mentioned there as the Israeli scholar who made, really made the contact with Russian formalism at the intelligence school. Uh, uh, Evan Zohar wanted to see cultures as systems of systems, that would be a poly system, that is, uh, you have a language, you have a way of eating, you have a military, you have a legal system, you have an economy, all these things fit, fit, fit together in a system of systems, the kind that we live around, that, that, that we live within, and he would ask, well, where in this system of systems, in the poly system, where do we find translated literature? Where do we find translation operating? And his general proposal is that translations tend to be peripheral. That is, they tend to be uh, not the kinds of texts that change things in the system. A central text would uh, generate new ways of seeing the world, would generate new forms of culture, uh, Evan Zohar's uh, general proposal is that translations are normally peripheral, conservative, if you like, and only exceptionally do they occupy central roles and bring about change in the uh, receiving policy systems. Okay, uh, I, I summarize uh, vast uh, quantities of research here. I think, though, the central concept, and the one that should be of most interest to you as practitioners, is that of norms. Uh, this was introduced by Gideon Turi, who, who, who recognized that very rarely, when we're translating, are there strict rules. We can say, that's right or that's wrong. You can in grammar, like a spelling mistake, you know, right and wrong. But a lot of what we're doing, when we're interpreting, or when we're translating, is a question of choice. We decided to do it that way, we could have done it the other way. Do you explain that Eton is a prestigious aristocratic school? It's not a law, it's not a rule. Do you repeat the term dragon naturally speaking when you're translating? But do you explain it? Do you use the English? Do you use the source script? Can we come? There's not entirely free will. You can't do anything you like, but it's not entirely regulated by laws where you're sunk if you don't. Okay? There's in between these two a, a field of norms. Uh, norms are dispositions to act, our modes of activity that are considered correct and for which there is some penalization if you don't adhere to it but it's not an outright law. Okay, it's not grammar. I'll give you some examples in a minute. Within translation studies we make some basic distinctions between different kinds of norms and I'll illustrate these two. First is what people expect you to do as a translator, and what translators expect of other translators, interpreters even more so. What you actually do, these will be the production norms that we can get by looking at text or looking at renditions. What people get better at as they become translators, and there a lot of research has gone on in that respect. And there are preliminary norms as to how a project gets set up. 
the simplest are production laws. Because, simply because you can just get the text and look at what's done with what frequency. Here, for example, are the production laws, what I've discovered, for your translations of Dragon Naturally Speaking. Remember we did that text two weeks ago? And uh, I can't read all your languages, but I can read the word Dragon Naturally Speaking, and I can see if you've used the English script, or if you've tried to translate it into something, or if you've used the English in a Russian form of it, and if you've used it once or twice. It was a short text, they had it twice in English. Okay? So, in my study, what do, what do I do? I've, just, I've got several options. You could have used the target language script, that is, got rid of the English entirely. This is just the word dragon, naturally speaking, the name of the company, in fact, of the product. You could explain what a dragon is. Leave dragon in English and explain what something is going on. You can use the source language for that once, or you could use it twice. Okay, so I've got these four basic options that I found. I didn't set out to do that, I just looked at what was done, and here's what I found. Four options. Okay? And then I map them according to the language groups. And I discovered that different languages do different things. And there's no rule for this. It's not a law. Because, you know, the people going into Korea, you know, all four options are present in Korea. And nobody felt particularly guilty, did they? But, I can say, the norm in Korean was to use Korean, the target language script. Okay? That was the norm, because the others are present, but it is the one that is by far the most popular. And in Chinese, but not, you know, the distribution is, Chinese are, are not as sure about it. Okay? <laughs> Koreans, as, as what we would call a, a translation culture, you know, the, the translators and the people who use translations are in a certain culture and, and they agree on certain ways of doing things within on this basic evidence that is only transitory, it seems that the Korean culture is fairly coherent. They decide that this is the norm. Other things can be done. Chinese culture is far more diverse. There's not, a, not the same level of agreement. Or there is toler tolerance for other kinds of solutions. Japanese really don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Except they didn't want to use the uh, uh, source language in Japanese, okay? You'll notice when you get to French, entirely coherent. France is this beautiful Cartesian culture where everybody agrees on logic. It's, sorry, I, I generalize from just a few people, but anyway. Spanish always has a few exceptions, but <laughs> uh, Germans reason things out very well, and so there is an obvious <coughs> cause for um, yeah, they all understand English anyways. Okay, what interested me was that between Asia and, and Europe, you see, Russia was really, really divided. Um, the, the Russian, because it has the, not the problem, but the, the, the virtue of having a, a non-Latin script, uh, but thinking about translation in a European way, um, you know, it, perhaps like the Chinese, but uh, has a, a mixed bag of norms there. So we can say over here the norms are fairly clear, over here the norms are fairly clear and quite different for obvious reasons, and in between we have cultures where norms may be in transition, or there may be different translation cultures within there, or different ideas. 